starting a new unit today. Um, we're going to back off from the math just for a little bit. Um, we're going to get some vocabulary kind of under our belts. There'll be a little bit of math topics, but they are smaller um, in size. They're not quite the stoichiometry unit that we just had. Um, so we're going to get some vocabulary out of the way, some skill sets out of the way with the kinetic molecular theory. And then after we have that kinetic molecular theory, then we're going to go back to the math and we're going to do the gas law units. Um, kinetic molecular, <coughs> sorry, kinetic molecular theory, we're going to start to look at the motion and movement of molecules. Um, so we're going to start off with some vocabulary again, and we're going to kind of bring that up to speed with where we are in terms of chemistry with the solids, the liquids, and the gases. So when we're looking at this unit and we talk about states of matter, I know that there are multiple states of matter. There is not just solid, liquid, gas, plasma. Um, you have Bose-Einstein condensates. You have um, supercritical fluids, things like that, that we don't deal with in this class. So because we don't deal with them in this class, we just omit them completely, and we only focus our efforts on solids, liquids, and gases. And when we talk about solids versus liquids versus gases, we're going to look at them on the molecular level. And when we look at them on the molecular level, we want to know what makes a solid a solid, what makes a liquid a liquid, and how do we go between the gas state and the liquid state, and what's actually happening there if you go from a solid directly to a gas and things like that. So in this unit, we're going to first define solids, liquids, gases. We're going to say what makes them a solid, a liquid, and a gas, and then we're going to look at um, some additional information like graphing and things like that. So with your three states of matter, we're first going to start with solids. And with your solid state of matter, it has a set or definite volume and a set or definite shape. That means that overall, if you have a solid like this calculator, if you set it down, it doesn't change its shape. So no matter what, the container, where it's located, whatever, it could be high, it could be low, it could be inside of a cup, whatever it is, that object will keep its shape. And that's because the little particles are actually stuck together and they're not able to move past one another. So they're in fixed positions. So a solid has a definite shape and a definite volume because the particles are in fixed positions. Now, a liquid um, has a definite volume, but it does not have a definite shape. So what that means is if I have a tablespoon of water and I pour the water into here and I know that I have that tablespoon or however many grams or whatever volume you're dealing with, and I pour this water into a different container, I still have a tablespoon of water. Um, if we're measuring in milliliters, what we should be doing in chemistry, let's say that I have 100 milliliters of water in a graduated cylinder, I dump those 100 milliliters of water into a beaker, I still have 100 milliliters of water. And that's because the particles are stuck to one another, but they don't keep their shape because they can actually move past one another. So they have a definite volume because the particles are stuck together, but they do not have a definite shape. Now the last state of matter that we care about for this class is a gas. A gas will always completely fill its container. No matter what container it's in, it will always take the shape and volume of that container. So if you have the air in the room, it's taking up the space and the volume of the room. If you breathe in, now it's taking up the space and the volume of your lungs. So no matter what container it goes into, a gas wants to completely fill its container. When it completely fills its container, it's going to take the shape and the volume of that container. It doesn't stay on the bottom. It doesn't float to the top. It always um, completely fills it. Now, this unit, you're going to hear me say this over and over and over, is going to go back to the kinetic molecular theory. Um, when we look at the kinetic molecular theory, or KMT is usually how I shorten it down, the word kinetic means motion or movement. So we want to know the motion or movement. Molecular is molecules. Um, so we want to look at the motion and movement of the molecules themselves. So we're going to describe the movement of those particles. 
And as we describe the movement of the particles, we need to remember that that movement um, is all basically temperature dependent. It's also, um, well, we'll just say temperature dependent for right now. So with your temperature dependent, if you increase the temperature of the system, the particles start moving faster, faster, faster. And as they start to move faster, 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 um, the state of matter might change. But then with your kinetic molecular theory, if you decrease the temperature, the little particles start moving slower and slower and slower, so that's going to give them different characteristics and properties. So when we look at the word kinetic, it just means motion or movement. Molecular means molecule. So we want to know how or how, where or how or whatever it is um, are those molecules moving. It can also be formula units, it can also be atoms. Um, the little particles is what we're really looking at there. So when we look at the kinetic molecular theory, there are several things that we're going to look at, whether it is the, um, I don't know, the shape, the size, the um, density, the, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones from the um, list, the fluidity, things like that. Um, that all goes back to gases first, and then liquids, and then solids. So when we look at the kinetic molecular theory, we're going to focus on gases today. We're going to focus on liquids and solids next week. And then um, when we move forward with those, we're going to kind of put everything together in some different units down the road as well. So when we look at the gas particles, they are very, very, very tiny. And one common misconception is people will think, oh, well, I've got this little particle, and with this little particle, let me get my water molecules. Here we go. Um, so these are little water molecules. With my little water molecules, one misconception is people think that when they go from the liquid state to the gas state, they magically get smaller or they magically get bigger when they turn into a solid or something like that, and that actually isn't the case. So if this is a model of a water molecule. It is the same size overall, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. It has the same mass, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. But the difference here is your gas particles are individual particles zooming around through space. So with these little gas particles that are zooming around through space, they're not stuck to anything else. When they stick to something, they make a liquid because they're going to have a force that makes them stick together. When they come together even more, they make a solid. So with your um, solid liquid gas, the particles themselves are the same, but they're very, very, very tiny because they're not stuck to anything else. They are just single little atoms, molecules, or formula units zooming around through space. Now, gas particles, they want to fill up their entire container completely. They do not get attracted to one another. So as they're zooming through space, they just kind of keep going in two different directions. And these guys are going really, really, really fast. Um, for example, a particle at room temperature that's, you know, just in the air is moving at about 1,000 miles an hour. It's moving really, really, really fast. Um, but they're constantly zooming around, bouncing off of things, and completely filling up their space of that container itself. Now, in between the gas molecules, like if I took a picture of a sample of water molecules, and they're just kind of like hanging out in space like this, if we take a picture of the air, which we normally think of as filling up this space around it, and we just have these two little particles there, in between those particles, there's nothing. It's just empty space. Um, now, these things are moving so fast that they pretty much fill up their container completely that it feels like the air is all around us all the time, and that's because of their speed and the quantity that's actually there. But in between the gas particles, there's actually nothing there, which is kind of weird for us to think about because when we think of nothing, there's air. Like, there's nothing right here. Well, there is because it's air. But in between the little particles that make up the air, there's nothing. Let's see. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to move this. There we go. Now, the little um, gas particles, they are always, always, always in motion. Everything above zero Kelvin is always in motion. So as long as you are above a zero Kelvin, which we've never even hit, the little particles are moving. So the gas particles are moving around in space, and they fill up their entire shape of their container. 
but even if you have a liquid, those particles are still moving. If you have a solid, those particles are moving. They're just kind of wiggling in place a little bit. But the gas particles, as long as you're above zero Kelvin, which you'd be a solid at that point, are always in motion. So gases always have to be moving, no matter what. Super, super, super fast. Now, with your gas particles hitting one another, if they hit one another, they don't stick to one another. If they hit the wall or they hit the ground or something like that, they don't actually bounce off of one another and they don't, well, they bounce off of one another, but they don't transfer any energy when they bounce off of one another. Like if you have a car accident, the two cars hit when they collide, there's a transfer of energy and that energy goes to the ground, it goes to the air, you have things flying, you have, you know, impacts, things like that. That doesn't happen with a gas particle. Gas particles are so super, super teeny tiny and because of their mass, when they hit something, they just keep going. They don't transfer energy to the wall or to the ground or whatever else. That collision is called an elastic collision. Um, some people say it's a perfectly elastic collision, but elastic just means that when they bounce, they don't transfer energy. If you have an inelastic collision, that's where if you like drop a basketball from like you hold a basketball above your head like this, you drop it, it bounces this high the first time, the second time it bounces here, the third time it bounces here, and it keeps losing energy each time. Part of that energy loss is due to sound because it's transferring that energy to your ear. Part of it goes to the ground, it's creating the vibrations. So you're losing a lot of energy all over the place. But with your gas particles, that doesn't happen. So if I have a gas particle and I bounce it, which you can't really bounce it, but let's pretend like we do, that gas particle would go floor, ceiling, floor, ceiling, floor, ceiling, floor, ceiling, floor, ceiling, indefinitely. It will not stop moving unless I change the temperature. That's the only time that these will actually change. Now the two factors that affect the speed of a gas molecule with the two factors that affect the speed of a gas molecule are temperature and the mass. And when we think about people, it kind of works the same way. But I've already kind of alluded to the fact that your temperature, if you increase the temperature, the particles move faster. When you decrease the temperature, they move slower and slower and slower till eventually they're going to move so slow that they turn into a liquid that liquid, you can make them move slower and slower and slower till eventually they turn into a solid. And then there's nothing below a solid um, for this class. Um, but there's nothing below a solid until you hit zero Kelvin. Once you hit zero Kelvin, all motion and movement stops. We haven't ever hit zero Kelvin, so everything has energy. As you increase the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy of those particles. When you increase kinetic energy, that just means that they're moving faster. People do the same thing. This was, you know, like go, taking my kids when I used to teach kindergarten outside in the winter time. They would go outside and they're like, I'm cold. I'm cold. Can we please go inside? Can we please go inside? Can we, I, I'm really, really, really cold. And they don't really move around a whole lot. But on those really nice days, they go outside and they are gone. And I'm having to drag them inside from recess. So as you get colder, you want to like shrivel up and you want to like not move around a whole lot just to conserve your energy. But when it gets warmer on nicer days, um, you do want to like move around and, you know, go play and things like that. So temperature affects humans. Temperature also affects gas particles. At a higher temperature, they move faster. At a lower temperature, they move slower. Now the other part is the mass. When we look at the mass of the particle, it's actually the molar mass that we are looking at. And if you have a larger particle, it's going to move slower. Um, if you, you know, look at a larger person, like on Biggest Loser, that TV show that used to be on, those people, when they were larger, typically moved slower than when they were the same person but smaller, taking athleticism out of it. Um, if I were to race against my five-year-old, my five-year-old is probably going to win. She weighs a lot less than me. Um, now she's a lot more athletic than I am, but again, we're taking that out of it. So with your particles, if you have a couple different particles, like let's say that we have water, my pen just died, sorry. If we have water and we have, 
I don't know, carbon dioxide. These are probably going to be backwards. Um, but if we have water and we have carbon dioxide and we want to know which one is going to move faster at the same temperature, we're going to have to find their molar masses. The molar mass without a unit, I'm just going to write down the number so we can focus on that part. If we look at the two molar masses, the water's molar mass is 18.02 grams, carbon dioxide is 44.01. Based off of mass alone, at the same temperature, water is going to move faster because it's lighter than your carbon dioxide. If you throw some hydrogen gas in there, and I say, which one is going to move the fastest? Hydrogen gas has a mass of 2.02 grams. So when we're looking at those molar masses, carbon dioxide is still going to be the slowest of those particles. Hydrogen is going to be the fastest. So the more mass that it has, the slower that they move. The less mass, the faster that they move. Now the density of a gas is very, very, very low. And that's because um, when we look at the actual particles that are there, they are spread out and not stuck to one another. So if I have a sample of a gas and I take a picture of it, those little particles are going to look like this. There's a lot of space in between those little particles that are there. If we go back to density, we have to remember that density is the given amount of mass in a certain amount of volume. There's not very much mass in this picture because my mass comes from my little purple dots. So there's not very much mass there, especially when we compare it to a solid where all of those things are going to be stuck together and your area is just that little bitty spot. So the density of a gas is very, very, very low. Because of that, gases are highly compressible. That means that I can take the particles that are there and squish them together more. So I can make them go together more. That just means that they have more collisions. When you compress a gas, the pressure goes up because you have more collisions. We don't know what pressure is yet, but we'll get there. Um, but you could make this container in this picture smaller just by compressing the little gas particles together. So they are very compressible. Now, if you remember, a gas always wants to completely fill its container. So because it wants to completely fill its container, it's going to automatically take the entire space of that container. So if you make the container bigger, it's going to fill up the space of the container. If you make that container bigger, it's going to make it take up more space. So gases are highly expandable because they want to stay as far away from one another as possible. As the gas expands out, their pressure goes down. As the pressure, or sorry, as the container gets smaller, the pressure is going to go up. And then we have a couple definitions, then I swear I'm done. Um, the first definition we have today is diffusion. So diffusion, we're also going to have effusion, but diffusion with a D um, is the fact that a gas, when you put it into a container, is going to completely fill the space of the container. So if you make an apple pie like it that's in this picture, that apple pie scent, any scent is a gas. So that scent is going to completely fill up the space of the container, which is usually the room or the house. Um, the same thing happens when somebody's wearing perfume or like a cologne or something. That perfume or cologne that's there, your body heat heats it up, turns it into a gas, throws it into the air, and it's going to completely fill up the space of the container. So that's why when you like walk past somebody, you can smell it really like strongly, but then when you have um, like somebody sitting in the same room, that scent kind of diffuses through, and as it diffuses through, it's going to completely fill up the space, and it might not be as pungent. Um, if somebody sprays like perfume, if I'm in the front of the room and I spray perfume, by the end of the class period, you might smell it at the like back part of the class period, just with natural movement in motion. So diffusion is just a gas wants to evenly fill up the space of its container. Now the opposite end of that spectrum, not opposite end, I don't know why I said that, um, a different word is called effusion with an E. An effusion is the fact that a gas, when there's a tiny hole or opening, is going to free. Um, so this is the, it's not ramen noodles, but I'm going to move my picture up here real quick. This picture right here is actually a balloon. So your latex balloon that you have um, has these little like tiny, basically like fibers, but it's a molecule basically, and they kind of get coiled up. Well, as they get coiled up, you can see that there's these little bitty teeny tiny holes. 
So you've got gas molecules under a high pressure inside of a balloon that are bouncing around. Well, as they're bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing around, if they hit one of those little holes, they are escaping like a jail inmate. They don't want to stay under pressure. So all these little gas molecules, as they bounce around, bounce around, bounce around, if they find that hole, now they're not actively looking at it because they don't have thought processes, but as they're bouncing around, bouncing around, bouncing around, if one of them accidentally hits that little hole, it frees. Now, as that hole gets bigger, more of the gas particles go through it at the same time, and that's why a balloon tears or pops. Um, but with these little bitty holes, this is why when you have a helium balloon, like an actual latex balloon, it's floating up the first day, and it's so nice and pretty, and happy birthday or whatever you're celebrating. And then the next day, it's kind of like a little bit lower, and then the next day, it's kind of like doing that weird hover thing where it's kind of like, you know, just like floating through the room, and then the next day, it's on the ground. That's because helium, um, the gas, is actually super, super teeny tiny and it's smaller than the air. So as those little gas molecules that are super teeny tiny hit these holes, they free themselves and it leaves just the air inside of the container. And as it leaves the air inside of the container, the less helium that's there that makes it float, the density goes down so it sinks, goes down a little more, goes down a little bit more. So um, that's why helium balloons don't last forever. That's also why mylar balloons, the ones with like the silvery outside to them, last longer than a latex balloon does, is because you don't have these little bitty holes that are there because it's made out of like a metal surface. Um, that's also why if you go to a balloon store, they sometimes have this like pump stuff that they'll put inside the balloon and it's to extend the life of the helium. Well, what it does is it coats the inside of the balloon hoping to fill in some of these little holes. Um, so that the science there does actually work. Um, but your children probably won't know what a helium balloon is unless we come up with a better solution to getting that helium back out of the atmosphere because we are um, quickly coming under a helium crisis. Um, sorry, I kind of got off topic there. Um, but your helium balloons themselves, like I said, they escape because of effusion. Now, I think I have like three more slides left today. Um, the other word that we need to define as we move through this unit is called pressure. And it's just how much force is in a given amount of area. Basically, it boils down to how many collisions are there. The more collisions the gas molecules have, the higher the pressure. The fewer the collisions that they have, the lower the pressure. So if you have a gas in this amount of space and you make the part the size of that bigger, you're going to have less collisions. That makes the pressure go down. But if you have that same original space but you make it smaller, the particles are colliding more frequently. As you collide more frequently, that pressure is going to go up. So we're going to talk about pressure quite a bit as we talk about gases, and it really just has to do with how many collisions are occurring in a certain amount of time. <clears throat> how those collisions are what happens with balloons. Balloons hold their shape because you have these particles that are hitting the outside of the balloon, and as they're hitting the outside of the balloon, it's actually holding it together like that. Two words to define, and then I'll be done. The last two words that we need to define are called barometer and manometer, and it's how we measure the pressure of a gas. Air pressure is different than an enclosed pressure, but air pressure is measured with a barometer, and if you remember in um, like weather readings and things, they'll talk about the barometric pressure. A barometer, they'll say like it's rising or it's falling is usually where you hear that from. But um, your barometer that you have basically measures how many particles are in the air at a given time. So it measures the pressure of the air. As your pressure is rising, so they'll say the barometric pressure today is rising. Like, I don't know what that means. What that actually means is as the barometer rises, that means that that rainy weather is moving out of the area. There's fewer particles in the, I'm sorry, there's more particles in the air. Now, as your barometer falls, that means that your um, air pressure is decreasing, and as your air pressure decreases, that means that rain or storms are moving in. The faster that it falls, 
that means that they, you're going to have worse storms than just like a little bit of drizzle. Um, during a tornado, you can actually watch. Now, I grew up in the Midwest, so that's probably, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this or not, but when a tornado is in the area, if you have a barometer, you can actually watch your barometer drop. And then when it goes away again, you can watch it go up. Normally it moves really, really, really slow and there's not a whole lot of motion or movement in it at all. Um, but during these like really bad storms with tornadoes and things, you can actually watch it. And I've watched it at school some days when we've had um, like tornado warnings and things like that moving through. Now what we'll see most likely in the lab is your manometer and a manometer is one of these things or one of these things, a tire pressure gauge, people usually call it. Um, your manometer is just something that measures the pressure of an enclosed gas. So if it's out in the open, that's barometric pressure, that's the air. Um, it doesn't matter if I'm in a building or on a mountain or in, you know, on the ocean, not in the ocean, but on the ocean. Um, but if you are enclosed at any sense of the word, you are using a manometer. So a tire pressure gauge is measuring the pressure inside of the tire. So that's a manometer. Inside of one of these little um, gas tanks, that's a manometer. If you have a propane tank, um, those have a manometer on them. And when we had one at my last house, it actually had like red, yellow, and green. And if you got to the yellow, you needed, you know, that you needed to call to get that filled. And if it was in the red, you better hope you don't need heat that night um, because it's going to run out. And that's just how many particles are actually inside of the container. And so the more pressure, the more particles. Actually, I probably said that backwards. Um, and then as you lose those particles, the pressure is going to go down and down and down. So those are just some vocabulary words, blah, words today. We're going to start to use those terms as we go through the next few units. Um, so we'll keep kind of putting things together, but um, hopefully the vocabulary made sense today. If you guys have any questions, ask. My email is mgable at crosbyisd.org.